This is going to be a long one. We're, we're going to, this is going to be a long scripture reading, so just know it right up front. We just got done with commercials. We got another few minutes. We're good. I'm just kidding. I don't know what I'm saying. All right. Here's the thing. It acts, acts is the beginning of the church. And so the beginnings of the church, they start recording the history of what's going on. It's really what I wanted to do is I want to intrigue you into reading more and more about God's Word. There's some really awesome stories in here in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so we're just going to roll with one for a while this morning, and you're going to see how awesome it is because our message is on sharing your faith. Amen? Wow, that's more than I thought. Because, uh, Oh, see, last week I said, if you're excited about that, say amen. If you're not excited, say oh man. I think I'd get more oh mans this morning. Because we don't, we don't like to share our faith. We don't really like evangelism that much. We're glad somebody told us. But wow, we're, we don't really want to share our faith. We don't know what to say and all those kinds of things. Well, I just want to roll through um, a, a little bit of this story. Now, let's just, in full disclosure, the early church was a lot like us. Chapter 12 is an awesome story that you need to read. I'll preach on it here sometime but uh, pretty soon. But uh, Acts chapter 12 is Peter. Peter's, Peter's proclaiming the name of Jesus and, and evangelizing, sharing his faith. And then what happens is he gets thrown in jail. So you know what the church does while he's in jail? They pray. They pray for him. And so they're just like us because they're praying for him. They all gather together in a house. And they begin to pray for Peter. An angel of the Lord comes and Peter's shackled in prison next to two guards. And the angel gets him out of prison. He shows up at the house well, where they're all gathered praying, and they, they're like, Oh, it's Peter. Well, wait a minute. It can't be Peter. Peter's in jail, and we've been praying for him. It must be his angel or something. And they're praying for Peter to be released from prison. When he shows up, they're like, What's going on? Yeah, they're kind of like us, aren't they? All right, so then we jump into Paul's first missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas. So Acts chapter 13 Stick with me. I'm going to basically do a little sermon here, but that's okay. It doesn't really count against my time later. So let's go. In the local church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simon, who is called Niger, and Lucius the Cyrene, and Manian, and a close friend who was a close friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And they were ministering to the Lord and fasting. And the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul, for the work that I have called them to. When they had fasted and prayed and they laid hands on them, they sent them off. Being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they came down to Seleucia, and there, um, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Arriving in Salmis, they proclaimed God's meshes to the Jewish synagogues, and they also had John as their assistant. So, they're being sent out by the Holy Spirit. Some of your Bibles may have a map. And it will show you we're over in the Mediterranean area right now. Those towns, we don't recognize them, but we're over it by the Mediterranean Sea. Verse 6. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came across a sorcerer, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. And he was with the proconsul and Sergius Paulus, which was an intelligent man. And this man summoned Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear God's message. But Elamus, the sorcerer, which is how his name is translated, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul away from the faith. So, just know this. Sometimes when you share your faith, what's going to happen? There's going to be opposition. So you're going to tell people about Jesus. There's going to be other people that are going to say, no, 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 you don't want to believe in that, right? So this is what's happening. Um, in verse 9, Then Saul, who is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, stared straight at the sorcerer and said, You son of the devil and all uh, the deceit, and all, you are full of all deceit and all fraud. You're an enemy of the all, all that's righteous. Won't you ever stop perverting the straight paths of the Lord? Now look, the Lord's hand is against you, and you are going to be blind, and you will not see the sun for a time. And suddenly a mist and darkness fell over him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. 
wow, that's kind of crazy, isn't it? Um, doesn't the Bible say that greater is he that is in you than what? Than he that is in the world? Yeah. So when you're sharing your faith, why are we afraid again? Okay, let's keep going. Verse 12. Then the proconsul, seeing what happened, believed and was astonished at the teaching about the Lord. And so Paul and his companions set sail for, from Patmos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John, however, left them and went back to Jerusalem. And they continued on their journey from Perga and reached Antioch in, the, in Poseidon. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. And after reading of the law and the prophets, the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them, saying, Brothers, if you have any message of encouragement for the people, you can speak it. So Paul took the opportunity, verse 16, Then standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and spoke and said, Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. <clears throat> the God of this people, Israel, chose, God chose our forefathers and exalted the people during their stay in the land of Egypt and led them out of it with a mighty arm. And from, for about 40 years, he put up with them in the desert. Don't you love how that's said? He put up with them for 40 years. And then after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. And this all took place over about 450 years. And after this, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king. So God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man from the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years. And then after moving, uh, removing Saul, he raised up David as their king, of whom he testified, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will carry out all my will. And from this man's descendants, according to the promise, God brought the Savior, Jesus, to Israel. Okay, let's stop there for a second, because we've been talking for a while. So they are far away from Jerusalem where Judaism started and they're trying to worship the God of the Old Testament but they don't believe in Jesus and so Paul is laying out an argument and starting, he's going to tell them about the history that they're very familiar with and then he's going to move toward Jesus. Now remember, they are at this time, they're thinking about Jerusalem and they're thinking about the synagogue and they... they the sights and the sounds and the smells of being in Jerusalem. And oh, they long to be back in the, the, the temple in Jerusalem. But they're far away in Antioch and other places. And they've come and they're in the synagogue and they're gathering with their people. And they're like, oh yeah, we know all about, you know, we know all about God brought the people of children out of Israel. We know how he established, you know, prophets and kings. And we know all about this. And they loved David. I cannot stress that enough. David is, boom, David is the top from them. And then he says, so remember that from the line of David is going to come the Messiah. So that's where we're at. Let's jump back in. Verse 24. And before he came to public attention, this Jesus, Messiah, John had previously proclaimed a baptism, that's John the baptism, of repentance to all the people of Israel. Then John was completing his life work as as john was wrapping up his life he said who do you think i am i'm not the one i'm not the messiah but look someone is coming after me and i am not worthy to untie the sandals on his feet paul says brothers sons of abraham's race and those among you who fear god the the message of this salvation has been sent to us for the residents of Jerusalem and for their rulers, since they did not recognize him or the voices of the prophets as they read every Sabbath in their temple. Every Sabbath they kept ready, reading, but they didn't realize that the words were being fulfilled. And those very words were condemning them. Verse 28, though they found no grounds for the death penalty, they asked Pilate to have Jesus killed. And when they had fulfilled all that had been written about him, they took him down from the cross, and they put him in the tomb, but God raised him from the dead. Amen? Verse 31, And he appeared for many days to those who came with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. Hey, there's people all around that have seen Jesus risen. And when ourselves, and, and we ourselves proclaim to you the good news of the promise that was made to our forefathers. God has fulfilled this to us. 
their children by raising up Jesus, as it is written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have become your father. Since he raised up Jesus from the dead, never to return to decay, he has spoken in this way. I will grant you the faithful covenant blessings made to David. Therefore, he also says in another passage, you will not allow your Holy One to see decay. For David, after seeing his own generation in God's plan, fell asleep. In other words, he died and was buried with his father and decayed. Stop. They know David. They love David. Now, now Paul is talking about this Jesus guy, and he's saying, listen, he, he was put on a cross. He died. He was put in a grave. But he will not see decay because God raised him from the dead. David, whom you love and who you follow and who you just revere, is dead. His body is in a grave. His bones are decaying. But not Jesus. Because Jesus is alive. Okay? So, where were we at? Somebody help me out. 37, thank you, because this is great. But the one Jesus, whom God raised up, did not decay. Therefore, let it be known to you, brothers, that through this man, forgiveness of sins is being proclaimed to you. And everyone who believes in him is justified from everything which could not be justified through the law of Moses. Wow. He's in a, he's in a synagogue telling them this. Okay? So be aware that what is said in the prophets does not happen to you. And then he quotes an Old Testament text. It's kind of confusing, so let's just skip over it. I want to go down um, to verse 43. After the synagogue had been dismissed, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who were speaking with them and persuading them to continue in the grace of God. The following Sabbath, almost the whole town assembled to hear the message of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to oppose Paul, what Paul was saying by insulting him. Then Paul and Barnabas boldly said, It was necessary that God's message be spoken to you first, but since you reject it and consider yourselves unworthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded to us. I have appointed you as a light to the Gentiles to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they rejoiced and glorified the message of the Lord. And all who had been appointed to eternal life believed. So the message of the Lord spread through the whole region. Okay, so we went to the synagogue. We started saying, hey, we believe in the Old Testament God just like you. But he sent Jesus and he raised him from the dead. And he's not going to see decay. David's seeing decay. But Jesus died. He will justify you. He will forgive you. He's our Savior and Lord. And some of them got mad. Some of them believed. And so here we are. Verse 50. But the Jews incited the religious women. This is so sad. But the Jews incited the religious women of high standing and the leading men of the city. Is, is, there a little, is there a little word of caution for us there? And they stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their district. But shaking the dust off their feet against them, they proceeded to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. And then the same thing happened in Iconium. They entered this Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way with a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up and poisoned the minds of the Gentiles against the brothers. So they stayed there for some time and spoke boldly in reliance on the Lord who testified to the message of His grace by granting them signs and wonders and performed through them. But the people of the city were divided and some siding with the Jews and some with the apostles when an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews, with the rulers to assault and stone them. They found out about it and fled to the Lyconian towns called to Lystra and Derbe and to the surrounding countryside. And there they kept evangelizing. So let me clear up a few things because I'm going to preach on this later. 
<clears throat> I want to clear up a few things. If the, the salvation is a work of the Holy Spirit. We, we declare that there is a God who has a son named Jesus, and he died for us. He offers us forgiveness and cleansing and, and justifies us. The, something that the Ten Commandments and the laws and all of our giving and all of our sacrifices can't do. And Jesus was risen, proving that he was the one. And he is seated at the right hand of God, his work completed. And this salvation is a work of the Holy Spirit of God. And when you proclaim this, you will receive some persecution. Because some people want to hear about Jesus, and some people want to stop you from telling about Jesus. And so what do you do? You wipe the feet. If you, if you declare the truth, symbolically, you wipe the feet off, the dust off your feet, and you go tell somebody else. What does God require of you? Obedience. To just declare, to testify to what you know is true, to testify about the good news of Jesus. It's not your job to save anybody. And you can't do it. There, is that just a load off your, take that load off. You can't save anybody. So what you do is you speak the truth in love and you declare the good news and some people are going to listen, and some people are not. Got it? I might not need to preach then. All right. So does that feel like a weight off you, some of you? Now, what we're going to talk about, well, I, I won't talk about what we're going to talk about later. We'll talk about later what we're going to talk about later. Okay, so this is, there's some, God, God is moving God is moving throughout Scripture, and God is moving today, and we just want to we just want to jump in where He's moving, Amen, and declare the truth. All right, so we're going to sing about this. We're going to worship the, the God that we're talking about today. I'm glad that you're here, and uh, and uh, let's let's pray. Let's um, look in our Bibles to Romans chapter 10, and we'll read this, and then we'll we'll review where where we've been. Romans chapter 10. Just three verses this time. Romans chapter 10, starting in verse 13. These will be familiar to you, so I'm going to ask you to finish off some of my sentences. Romans chapter 10, verse 13 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved so who everyone. everyone so this is a this is a pretty i don't need to spend a lot of time here everyone who calls on the name of the lord will be saved verse 14 but how can they call on him in whom they have not believed and how can they believe without hearing about him and how can they hear without a preacher and how can they preach unless they are sent as it is written how Beautiful are the feet of those who announce the good, the gospel of good things. So, Father, we just ask again that you would bless the words, guard my mouth, make our ears attentive and our hearts open. In Jesus' name, amen. So, for six weeks, we've been on this journey. I've tagged it in with our L3 model to love God, learn together, lead others. Two weeks for each one. So, the, two, the first two weeks are loving God. So we visually, we started over here, didn't we? And, and step one of any journey with the Lord is you passionately fall in love with God. Passionately falling in love with God. And what happens is you begin to know Him and understand Him. You realize who He is and who you are. And you fall passionately in love with Him. And you that causes repentance. That means, wow, I've done some things I shouldn't have done, and wow, he's a holy God, and boy, he's, God so loved the world, and he wants to save me, and so you get all excited about that, and you fall in love with him, and what happens is when you fall in love with him and you realize who he is and who you are, it draws you to step number two, and here's why.
because we get a real clear picture, again, of who he is and who we are. It reminds me of Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, when Isaiah says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And I don't have it all memorized completely, so let me cheat and read this. He says, The Lord is high, seated high and on a lofty throne, and his robe filled the temple, and seraphim were, were there, standing above him, and they had six wings. With two they covered their eyes, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they did fly. And they said to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. His glory fills the whole earth. The foundations of the doorway shook in the, at the sound of their voices, and the temple was filled with smoke. Then Isaiah says, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among people of unclean lips, because my eyes have seen the King. Did you just get the picture there? Who He is? Woe is me, for I am unclean. And I've seen the King. Right? So we begin to understand who God is and who we are. So let me tell you, we have a lot of guests here every Sunday, and I'm really thankful about that. If you're going to a church where the pastor only always encourages you to be better and better and more of you, it's what you really need, he's leading you down the wrong path. Because part of the proclamation of the good news is, Good news is only good if it invades a dark spot. Is, it, is that right? So the good news is only good is because we're in a bad spot. If we, if we weren't in a bad spot, we don't care about the good news. So the Bible says, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, why did He need to love the world? Because 17 says that you are condemned already. So more of you just gets you more condemnation. So instead, God wants to invade. Uh, listen, we're good people, right? Like we're good, hearty Iowa, small town, good people. Illinois, wherever we're from, we're good people. We're good neighbors. But we've fallen short. We see, I, I saw in the, King Uzziah, in, the, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. And he was high in this, it was a beautiful temple. And it just, it made me shrink when I thought of myself compared to him. His holiness is so amazing. We fall in love with Him in step one and we realize how, how little we are and how big He is, how sinful we are and how holy He is. And it's a great perspective. See, let me finish this text in Isaiah chapter 6. It says that one of the seraphim flew to me. So he used two of his wings. And he flew to me and in his hand was a glowing coil that he had taken from the altar with tongues. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your wickedness is removed and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I replied, Here am I. Send me. Because we're over here and we're falling in love with the Lord, and we realize how majestic and amazing He is, how big He is, and how small we are, holy, unholy, on and on and on, right? Let's keep going. I could, I could use these all day long. And we say, oh, you're the king. I'm not. Step two, I will obey you. You are my Lord. You, you are my Lord. You are my Savior, but more than that, you're my Lord, you're my master, you're my owner, and I will do what you want me to do. I will be obedient. The first step of that is to be baptized. We've got several people tomorrow night. The elders are going to talk to several people who want to be baptized. Praise the Lord. Amen. They, they realize, like, hey, I've, I do love the Lord, and I've never taken this step, next step, so I, I want to get that done. And maybe some of you need to do that as well. You can talk to us tomorrow night. Just see me after the church service, because or come up after during the invitation or whatever, because we need to take that second step of obedience. We'd be baptized because we've, we've repented and we've fallen in love with the Lord. Now we want to follow Him in, in baptism, and then there's a lot of other things that God wants us to do. How do we know what to do? Step three, we read His Word. 
See, the Bible contains the very words of God. You want to know what God's saying to you? Read the Bible, because they're His words. So how do I know what to obey Him in? Read the Word. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, righteousness, so that we can grow to be a better man and a woman of Christ. So we read the Word. Well, it's kind of, sometimes when I read the Word, I don't know what's going on. I can't understand it. I don't know how that applies. So guess what we do? We join together. We, the, we join together as the church. We get in small groups and Bible studies and prayer groups, and we join together as the church, and we come together and we talk about what the Bible says, and we do the one another's. Remember the one another's of two weeks ago? Love one another, encourage one another, um, be unified with one another. All those one another's we do because we're a church family. God's called us together. So we're not lone rangers. We're together in this. And we work together to, to benefit each other and to uplift each other and to stand beside each other. And when one person has a need, we all have a need because we're in this together. And we realize, and this is hard for me, probably hard for some of you, but we have to realize that we are better together than by ourselves. I, I'm not sure I fully buy into that yet, but I'm trying. I'm just telling you. Because aren't you that way? Don't you like to do things by yourself sometimes? I don't want to train you. I don't want to have to, okay, so I just, I'll just do it myself. That's, I got that from my dad. He knew how to do everything, and I grew up knowing how to do nothing. Why? Because my dad's like, I mean, he's a great man. I, I mean, but he like didn't want to take the time to train me on all that stuff. So he's just like, hey, I'll just do it myself. Why don't you go help your mom? Okay, so anyway. Anyway, I don't know. And so that probably explains a lot of things. Anyway, all right, let's keep going. So are you, are you, are you with me? So we fall in love with him. We, we decide he's the Lord. Whoever should call in the name of the Lord... He's our owner, our master, will be saved. So we, we love him. We want to obey him. What do we obey? We read the Bible. Wow, I, some, some of it doesn't make sense. Let's join together and work together. And then, and then number five, step number five, is as we join together as the body of Christ and begin to work together, we realize that, wow, God's gifted us in some things. So step five is using our gifts together to help each other. Because some of you, all of us, have at least one gift. Some of us have many gifts. And they're used for the glory of God and to serve each other. Glory of God, serve each other, right? So God's given them for you not to hold on to, but to use. And then once we begin to understand this story, actually it doesn't have to like be a year in between. It can be really, really quick. And then what needs to happen is we need to be start sharing the good news this is what happened to me i can see you you're struggling i can see you need the lord let me tell you what happened to me and we testify our testimony like emily said did last week in front of us emily she gave a testimony what is that this is what happened to me you can't argue with somebody when they give a testimony this is what i was like this is what jesus did for me here's where i am now okay So let's get back to Romans 10, because i got to get going. All right, Romans 10. So there's, there's our visual, right, those six steps. So let's just talk a little bit about step six. We, um, we don't like step six, but let me ask you a couple questions. Do you love talking about things that you're passionate about? football teams, grandkids, whatever. Okay, I think, I think I'll just leave it there. I think, you know, because we get to step six and we're like, I'm not into that. But don't you love to talk about things that you're passionate about? So let me just say, if you're not afraid to talk to people about your grandkids or about your job or about whatever, I, I just really need to ask you, like, where did, where did you go off track? Remember I said you can't just jump into number three or number four or wherever. You can't jump in here. You have to go through in order. So I'm over here and I'm passionate about Jesus. But I'm not going to talk about him in front of anybody. 
you went off track somewhere. You did. Because, uh, listen, I've had this conversation with some of you. So here, okay, we got a lot of excuses. Let me just, my mind is working faster than my mouth. We, um, we I'm afraid. I, I don't know what to say. What if I don't have all the answers? What if they disagree with me? Well, we just read in Acts chapter 13, there's going to be disagreement. That's, but what if I don't have all the answers? I've had this conversation with some of you. It's like, oh man, I saw this movie. It was so awesome. I'm, I'm horrible with names. I don't remember the name of it, but it was, it, was, it was so cool. It was this really exciting drama. And that one guy, who's the actor, that guy that was in the dinosaur movie. What, like, I've had that conversation with some of you. I'm not embarrassed to start down a road where I don't have a clue what I'm talking about. Right? Right? And, and so do you. And that, that's why we whip out our smartphone. Hold on just a second. I'll, and we get the answer. We did that at lunch last Sunday with somebody. Right? And this lady got out her phone. It's like, oh! And we all, I, oh yeah. See, we're not afraid to go down that road. But when it comes to talking about Jesus, we, if, if I don't have all the answers, I'm not even going to start. You're just testifying about what you know and what's happened to you. So let's throw that one out because you're not afraid to do that in any other area of your life. I don't. I like the Dallas Cowboys. I'm sorry to say it, but I don't hardly know any of the players. But I mean, I'll talk about them. You know, I know they have injuries. That's our excuse. Let's go on. How about those Hawkeyes? Six and seven. See, I don't even watch the news. So there you go. Seven. Are they really? Seven and no. All right. All right, where was I here? Okay. So evangelism is simply spreading the good news. Spreading the good news, evangelism. Um, giving testimony to what has happened to you. All right. So, hey, pastor, I've always been told not to talk about politics or what? Religion. See, we all got that down. What a silly thing that is. Both of those control your life and how you live your life, don't they? Why would we not want to talk about those? So let's stop for a second and realize that Thanksgiving and Christmas are coming faster than we want to admit, aren't they? And we're going to be gathered together with our families. And if you're like me, there's part of your family that needs to know about Jesus. Is it not true that your family members are the hardest ones to talk to about Jesus? So we get together with our family and we'll talk about football and we'll talk about, hey, you know, you know ice fishing and we'll talk about all kinds of things, whatever your hobbies are, but we won't share Jesus. Isn't that kind of, isn't that kind of silly? And here's where we come in. The body of Christ. Here's, here's, step number, here's step number four. This is where the body of Christ comes together because guess what? That's why we encourage each other. That's why we love each other and pray for each other. So it's like, hey, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to meet some of my family and they, and they don't know the Lord. Hey, guys, come here. Can you pray for me? Can you ask that I would have boldness to share the truth? All right? And, and then when we get back, we gather together and you're like, oh man, I, I, didn't, I didn't bring up Jesus at all. I chickened out. Hey, that's okay, brother. I mean, I, you know, I do the same thing. Let's, you know, God forgives you. Let's move on. And by the way, I think Pastor Ken talked earlier in his first message that it's not really up to you to save him anyway. It's a work of the Holy Spirit of God. And so we encourage each other. Are, are you tracking with me? This is step four, where we rally together and we, all these one another's and love one another, encourage each other. And some of us, sometimes maybe you just need to be saying, dude, next time you're going to feel bad if next time you don't step up. All right, so whatever it is, we talk to each other. All right, so Romans, Romans 10. For everyone who calls, verse 13, for everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. But, verse 14, but how can they call on him whom they have not believed? How are they going to know? 
and how can they believe without hearing about him? This is why step six is so important. Because evangelism is proclaiming about Jesus Christ, the good news about Jesus Christ. Look at me. Proclaiming. Proclaiming. Um, when we go out to eat, we always pray before we, we eat. And I'm sure a lot of people look around and see us. Never to this day have we had anybody come running up to us and say, Oh man, I want what you have. That was so awesome that you prayed. I, I want Jesus. I want. Never happened. I've helped people out and people have helped me out. You know, you're neighborly, you're kind, you open doors for people. Never had somebody stop and say, wow, what do you do? I'm a pastor. Oh, well, tell me about Jesus. I'm so thankful you opened the door for me. Or you have that really cool T-shirt on, and I really, right? Sharing the good news is proclaiming. Doing socially good work and all that kind of stuff, that's great. But that's what we should be doing anyway. That's what we should be doing all the time, loving your neighbor as yourself. And people recognize that you are a Christian, but along this step here, how many of you have like, yeah, I guess, uh, no, I can't, I can't go golfing this morning. I, I go to church on Sunday. Oh, please tell me about Jesus. I want to be like you. Any ha happen to anybody? No, they're like, oh, all right, I'll find a fourth somewhere else, right? Um, because... The good news is, was that graceful? No, not really. Okay, the proclamation of the gospel, evangelism is proclaiming with your mouth, not doing good deeds. I didn't say stop doing good deeds. I said that's what you should be doing anyway, right? So how are they going to hear? How are they going to believe unless they hear? How are they going to hear unless you proclaim? Don't worry, you're off the hook because I'm not going to skip the next phrase. It says this, and how... Can they hear without a preacher? Everybody do this. Okay, so I guess it's all on me. Not really, because that word preacher means simply to someone who declares. It's, it's, not, a, it's, not, a, it's not a job title. It means someone who um, calls for, uh, speaks forth the, the words. And guess who that is? It's me. Pastor Dusty, it's the elders, deacons, and and you. And you. Uh, how how are your neighbors? How are your coworkers? How are your friends? How is your family going to believe if they don't hear? How are they going to hear unless you proclaim the truth with your mouth, with your words? Well, again, I, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. Oh, yes, you do. Because remember when I was going through and reviewing this, and, and you were thinking, oh, six weeks in a row? We, we know already. Oh, really? So you know. I thought you didn't know. Caught you. Okay, let's go. Does that make sense? Just I, I did this visually. I want you to see visually. You, you fall in love with God. Why? Because He is holy and you need to repent of who you are. And then you want to be obedient to Him. You find it in the Bible. You, you know you can't do it by yourself, so you study together. God calls us to use our gifts and proclaim the truth. Where are you in this? When, when you need to start proclaiming the truth, just visually go through that in your mind. Just visually go through that. And you'll be glad that I went over it and over it and over it and over it. You're welcome. Okay. Let's keep going. How can they hear without a preacher? That's, that's me, and that's who? There you go. And how can they preach unless they're sent? No, don't do that, because the Great Commission says, go. Hey, believers, go ye therefore. Well, I'm not a missionary. I haven't been called to be a missionary. You're right there. Man, you got me. I didn't even think about that one. What's a missionary? A missionary, see, we need to do some verbiage uh, renewal. We do this almost every week. We've got to renew how we think about things. 
I feel called to be a missionary. I feel called to go to Paraguay or the Philippines or, or Guatemala as a missionary. That, and that does happen. And so what they do is we support these missionaries who go, who go let's say they go to Guatemala. And they go and they live in Guatemala and they interact with the people and they make friends and they have a job. And so there's co-workers that they try to influence for Jesus Christ. And there's neighbors that they try to get to know so they can influence for, for Jesus Christ. And they, they make connections and they have Bible studies so that they can share Jesus Christ with people in Guatemala. And then God's called you to be a missionary right where you are to do those same things. Because, see, I'm not, I don't work where you work. I don't have the family that you have. I don't have the neighbors that you have. That's why God put you where you are, to be a missionary, to proclaim the good news of Jesus.